Well, hello. I am Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and welcome to the short Bible study on Matthew 21, 33 to 46. Pastor Steve and I offer these short studies for our viewers each week as a way to dig a little deeper into the text, as a way to think about the gospel reading before you actually hear it in church on Sunday. We hope that these short lessons uh, bring insight and a time of thinking, a time of digging into the word, and a time of wondering and wandering. So as we begin to get ready to dig into the word today, let's pray. Good and gracious God, Lord, we know that you come to us in so many different ways. But God, as we take a look at these parables that Jesus presents to us, bring them clear to us. Give us the eyes to see them maybe in a whole new way or bring clarity to the way we've heard it before. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start off with our scripture reading right away today. So take out your Bibles. If you don't have it with you, you can hit pause or you can just follow along with us um, on our slide that we have for you. Our reading today, again, is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, 33 to 46. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he released it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to the other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on his on the stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. So let's take a look at this parable in its larger context. This parable begins a lot like our Isaiah passage that we had in 5, 7 through 12, or 1 through 7. It takes place in a vineyard. And it's the third parable in Matthew with a vineyard setting. So let's take a look. Our first parable happened a couple weeks ago with 21 through 16, the workers in the vineyard. And then we had this past week, 21, 28 to 32, of the two sons. So what does the vineyard represent? In Isaiah, it represents Israel, and many have assumed that it is the meaning in this parable that we have today. That is, the vineyard equals Israel, the tenants equal religious leaders, landowners, slaves, equal prophets whom they rejected. With this interpretation, we note that the vineyard is not destroyed, but turned over to a new tenant. To use another biblical metaphor, the unfaithful greedy shepherds are removed and new shepherds are installed to care for the sheep. This is one way to interpret the parable, and in some ways it can seem like the most obvious way. But we need to look at uh, one of the verses that causes us to look a little bit deeper into the parable. Let's take a look in verse 43. We see here that Jesus indicates that the vineyard is the kingdom of God. In that context, who do the tenants and landowner owner slaves represent? And perhaps another even better question is, who are we in the parable? 
If we, that is, all believers, are the tenants, I think that the vineyard represents all places where we have been called by God to produce the fruits of the kingdom. Those places could easily include our households, our place of business, our school, our neighborhood, our clubs, and our congregations. And of course, the list, when we start listing that, goes on and on and on and on. It really helps us think about um, what is God's kingdom. Is our parable given by Jesus in part to continue to deal with the question of the chief priests and the elders in the temple going back a few verses in Matthew? When they ask the question, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Perhaps authority is also a part of this parable and thinking about whose authority. So let's consider some of the opposition that we have within the text. Daniel Pat Pate writes in the Gospel According to Matthew, a structured commentary on Matthew's faith. He suggests oppositions between the wicked tenants and the ideal tenants. The wicked tenants are those who, one, do not want to give the fruit to the owner, unwilling to produce, maybe the question to ask is, are they unwilling to produce the proper fruit? Two, they reject the owner's authority. And three, they're working for themselves. Some of these same characteristics are repeated in the opposition between what the father says about his son. They will respect him. And what the tenants say, let's kill him. By killing the son, they reject the father's authority. By seeking to inherit the vineyard, they show their desire to work for themselves. A question that is sometimes asked but isn't fully answered in this text is, how could the tenants think that they would inherit the vineyard? It would seem quite presumptuous to think that by killing the owner's son, that the owner would give them the vineyard. Perhaps they assume that the owner was dead and his son was now the owner. Why else would he be coming? It's not that long ago that there was a slogan out there that said God is dead. It was a popular slogan. Whether these tenants thought that or not, they acted as if God, the landowner, were dead. What difference should it make in our lives if we believe God is alive versus believing God is dead? Have you ever heard the critique that most Christians are functional atheists? They believe in God, but they function, live and act as if there were no God. I think that's a really important question for us to consider and to think about. So let's take a look at the new tenants and the responsibility that the new tenants would have. As part of the judgment, Matthew makes it clear that the new tenants have the same responsibility as the old, to give back to the owner the fruits at their proper time, in verse 41. New tenants who think that they are working for themselves could face the same fate as the old ones. Even if we Gentile Christians could suffer the same punishment if we reject the owner's authority over us, if we fail to give back the fruit at the proper time. While salvation might only be God's grace, in Matthew, there is something expected of those who have been graced into the kingdom, the arena where God rules. We are expected to live under the authority of the owner, to produce and give back the proper fruit. The question we ask is, now that you are saved, what are you going to do? God has some expectations of us. In Matthew's terms, we are to bear fruit. So let's take a look at the cornerstone. Jesus mentions this in the scriptures, it is said. The idea of Jesus being the cornerstone, the key element in one's life, the thing around which all other things are connected or held together or lined up by, in contrast to this are the tenants whose lives revolved around self and what they can get for themselves. How does our life change when Jesus is that cornerstone in our life? And while we might believe it, going back to the idea that some people or the phrase of God is dead, that even Christians can be atheists because they aren't really living as if Jesus were the ones in his teachings. They aren't really living their life according to Jesus' authority. 
So let's take a look at the cornerstone here in a little bit deeper. Another of Matthew's answers, which we have already seen, is the unwillingness to accept God's authority over us and our desire to work for ourselves. The question that started Jesus' series of parables was, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? The slaves and son come with the authority of the landowner. The tenants will not accept them as such. They see them as threats to their own lives perhaps even more specifically, threats to their economic life. The slaves and the son seek to take away what the tenants had assumed was their own profits, the work of their hands. Sin is not primarily about doing bad things. Sin is also an attitude, and in this case, it's an attitude of selfishness that has no need for God. In fact, God becomes a nuisance who gets in the way of things and oftentimes gets in the way of our selfish desires. An example of this might be demanding that we give to God some of our produce that we may have worked so hard to get. So we kill God and God's messengers. In verse 43, who are the you that the kingdom is taken away from? They are those who do not produce the fruits of the kingdom. In Matthew, good fruit is produced naturally from a good tree. The good fruit from a good tree happens so naturally that by implication, the righteousness, the good people, aren't even aware that they have produced good deeds. The key to producing good fruit is to stay connected to and rooted in God. As a Christian, we have responsibilities. In Matthew, I believe, is trying to make that clear to us. Let's go back to Galatians 2.10, where it is very clear that Paul says to the early church, remembering the poor was a requirement. The only cure I know of for selfish greed is to be giving stewards. When trees bear fruit, it is not for the sake of the tree, but for others who receive nourishment from the fruit. Animals, from small worms to large beasts, may eat the fruit. Humans may harvest them to see for themselves or, or to use for themselves or sell as food to others. Christian fruit-bearing are acts done for the good of others. This leads to another answer of why people reject Jesus. They don't want to assume the responsibilities of being a Christian, of living for the sake of others. In contrast to Jesus' earlier parables in chapter 13, which outsiders were not able to understand, the chief priests and the Pharisees know that he has spoken against them. But even though they understand it, they continue to reject the cornerstone. They seek to arrest him. At the same time, they indicate who has authority over them. It is not God. It is not the Torah. It is the crowd. They fear the crowds, but not God. They allow their fear of the crowds to determine their actions. How often are we like that? Perhaps this parable brings to us the problem of selfishness. The problem with the wicked tenants and with the chief priests and the Pharisees, and often with us, I would add, is that they and we are unable to perceive what is simultaneously truly good for them, a useful stone and worthy of honor, as the keystone is. Actually, they can recognize that the Son, Jesus, is indeed the Son of the owner, the Son of God, who therefore manifests the authority of God even more directly than the servants. Similarly, rarely, they can recognize that the servants, John, the tax collectors and prostitutes who repented, are walking in the way of the righteousness, and that they manifest the authority of God. But these manifestations of the authority of God do not have, for them, any value whatsoever and are therefore not worthy of honor. Ultimately, they fail to acknowledge God's authority. 
The tenants, seeking to do what they think will be good for themselves, keeping the fruit, killing the slaves and son, seeking to inherit the property, rejecting the owner's authority, bringing destruction upon themselves, selfishness can be deadly for both individuals or groups. So let's think about this. Just a couple questions to ponder this week, and hopefully you'll spend some time meandering in this text, reading it more than once. What is fruitfulness? What does Jesus mean? Or perhaps the, go the gospel writer Matthew mean about bearing fruit? And is it possible that some Christians see their faith more as a hobby than a way of life? How do you see this lived out? I'd like to thank you for taking time in this week to dwell in the word, to walk in it, to think about it for a little while. And um, I pray that as you continue to look at this scripture, that God will continue to reveal to you what he wants you to hear. Our, my, most of my resources this week, week came from Brian Stoffergren at crossmark.com. Let's end this time now in prayer. Lord God, we give you praise and thanks for the blessing of this time, this time in which we were able to wander in your word. Lord God, like I mentioned earlier, may you point out to us some of our areas in our life where we might not give you the authority where we want to keep it. May you point to us where we are not bearing fruit, but perhaps we could. Place upon our hearts the people whom you want us to share your good news with so that more may bear fruit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day.